In this series of revision lectures, I'm going to go through the learning outcomes that I've already given you for each part of the course and try to exemplify what it is you're expected to know. I'll more or less stick to the order that I've already given you the learning outcomes, though occasionally a couple might change the order slightly. We'll start by looking at the first part of the course, controlling the rate of reaction. In this first lecture, we're going to look at the learning outcomes for the reaction rates. The first learning outcome uh, is to understand why it is important for chemists to control the rate of reaction. Well, if as an industrial chemist you're trying to make some product and the reaction is very slow, then it's not very economical for the factory. So we normally want to try and speed up that reaction. On the other hand, if reaction is very fast, we might uh, be in a situation where there's a possibility of an explosion happening. So in that case, you'd want to slow down the reaction. Or it could be that the reaction is unwanted, for example, a car rusting. And so we do all we can to try and slow down the rate at which the car rusts. So that's some of the reasons why we're interested in the rate of reaction as chemists. Now, at National 5, you learnt to calculate the rate of reaction from graphs of a changing property versus time. For example, a graph of volume against time, or a National 5, it would be also might be a graph of mass loss against time. So, I would use the equation, which is in your data booklet, the rate is the change in quantity over the change in time, where the quantity is either the volume or the mass loss. If it was mass loss, for example, or if it was volume of gas, we might uh, carry out the experiment in uh, app using apparatus like this, where the gas goes into a gas syringe and we can measure the volume of gas produced at different time. And from that data, we could end up plotting a graph of volume of gas against time. And we could use this equation to work out, say, for example, the rate of reaction over the first six seconds. So over the first six seconds, the volume of gas has changed from zero to 35. So the rate of reaction for the first six seconds would be 35 divided by 6, which is 5.8. That's in cubic centimetres per second. So cubic centimetres per second. If you are asked a question like that in the higher, you might be, the graph might be of say concentration against time. And again, we'd use the equation rate equals change in quantity over change in time. And if we're asked for the reaction rate over the first six seconds, over the first six seconds, the concentration has changed from one to 0 0.25. So the change in concentration of the first six seconds would be 0 0.75. So it would be 0 0.75 divided by 6. And that equals, I think that's 0. Point, well, I better check. 0 0.75 divided by 6. 0 0.125. And that would be in moles per liter, which is that unit divided by seconds, so mole per litre per second. However, at higher, it's more likely that we carry out the experiment by timing how long a reaction takes to reach a specified point. And you should be able to calculate the reaction rate when given the time for a reaction to reach a specified point I should be able to calculate the time when given the reaction rate. And in this case, you'd use the equation, again, which is in your data booklet, of rate equals 1 over time. And the graph would have temperature or concentration along the x-axis and rate up the side. So let's look at a couple of questions you could get asked. 
So here's our graph of temperature against rate. What was the time of reaction at a temperature of 40 degrees? So we're asked for a time. Time isn't given in the graph, but if we know the rate, we can work out the time. So at 40 degrees, right, we have a rate of 0, 0.0. So the rate equals 0 0.033 per second. In your data booklet, you have the equation rate equals 1 over time. So you have to, to rearrange that and you just swap time and rate. So from that we can derive that time equals 1 over rate. We know the rate is that. So the time is 1 over 0 0.033 which equals so 1 divided by 0 0.033 equals 30.3 and it's in seconds. Okay. Oh, here's another re question. What temperature gave a reaction rate of 20 seconds? Okay, we've got a graph, but again, it's rate, not time on the graph, but using our equation, rate equals 1 over time. So the rate is 1 over 20, which equals 0 0.05 per second. So we look at the rate of 0 0.05 and we get our temperature. Uh, not many grid lines on this graph, so it can't be too accurate. So let's say temperature looks if it's roughly about... 48 degrees C. Okay, so you should be able to manipulate rate and time using this equation here. Okay, so having carried out various experiments, uh, you should be able to predict how uh, the rate of chemical reaction will be affected by changing the concentration. If we increase the concentration, we increase the rate of reaction. Pressure. Again, increase the pressure, increase the rate of reaction. Particle size, if we decrease the particle size, we increase the rate of reaction. Temperature, increase temperature, increases reaction rate. Or using a catalyst, catalyst speeds up reaction rate. However, at a higher level, you should be able to use collision theory to explain how these, effect these factors affect the rate of reaction. So let's have a look at collision theory. So you should be able to understand the concepts of collision geometry and activation energy within collision theory. So basically collision theory states for A and B to react, they have to collide. Now not every collision will result in the reaction. Firstly, the collision has got to have the correct geometry. So in this top one, it's got the correct geometry because the way A and B are bumping into each other it allows them to split up to produce two molecules of AB whereas if they collide in this geometry it doesn't allow them to split up to give two molecules of AB so the geometry has got to be correct and also they've got to collide with enough energy okay? so a very very gentle collision would often not be enough to allow this activated complex to be formed the collision's got to have enough energy to allow this to be formed. So at one level, anything that increases the number of collisions is likely to increase the number of fruitful collisions. So increasing the concentration of solutions, we're more likely to get the reactants to collide. So more likely to get more fruitful collisions. If you... Uh, Increase the pressure of gases, there's more gases in there, more particles are to, there to collide, so you get more collisions. If you decrease the particle size, you increase the surface area, so there's a bigger surface area for the reactants to 
bang into and collide. Temperature, the effects of temperature and catalysts are slightly more subtle though. So in order to explain the effects of temperature and catalysts on collision theory, we've got to look at things in a wee bit more detail. So your learning outcome is to understand the energy distribution diagrams and can explain the effect of increasing temperature or adding a catalyst on the rate of reaction. So this is an energy distribution diagram. The shape of the curve depends on the temperature of the, let's say it's a solution. So at a given temperature, not all particles in the solution will have the same kinetic energy. Some will be moving around slowly, most will be around about this average, and some will be moving very fast. Well, let's say for this reaction, this here represents activation energy. So particles must have a must be moving faster than this to have enough energy to form the activated complex. So for this solution, only these particles here, only these particles here, a very small percentage, have enough energy to form the activated complex. So this is going to be quite a slow reaction at this temperature. Let's say this is 20 degrees C. But a relatively small increase in the temperature, say to 30 degrees C, drags this peak to high energy and a wee bit lower in height. So, so at 30 degrees, your energy distribution diagram changed from the red to the blue. And there's a huge increase in the number of particles. I've got an energy greater than the activation energy. It's all these particles now. So a relatively small increase in temperature can result in a very large increase in the number of particles with an energy greater than the activation energy and so causes a large increase in the rate of reaction. Okay, what about the effect of a catalyst? Right, so let's start off the same situation again. We're at a temperature of 20 degrees. This is our activation energy. Which is quite high, so only a relatively small number of particles have enough energy to react. Now if we use a catalyst, we don't change this red line because we're not changing the temperature. Okay. But if we use a catalyst, we can change the activation energy. So using a catalyst, the activation energy, so this E8 with the catalyst, is far smaller. And so at the same temperature, again, you've made a huge increase in the number of particles with an energy greater than the activation energy. Now the catalyst does this by providing an alternative uh, route for the reaction. So it's a different activated complex that gets formed and this activated complex requires far less energy to form it than this one. Okay so that's probably the main learning outcomes for the first part of the rate of reaction section. The probably most important thing to be able to do is use the rate equals 1 over t equation and be able to explain the effect of pressure, concentration, particle size, catalysts and temperatures on the rate of reaction using collision theory. And make sure you don't get the catalyst and the temperature uh, descriptions mixed up.